Okay, so this is lecture nine addendum. Um, so what we're going to be covering in this lecture is essentially the last portion of it with respect to fading. Okay, so we looked at a little bit about the idea of the mobile radio propagation effects, about signal strength, and about fading. And so people say, what's, what's this fading? Like, wh what does this mean? What, electromagnetically, like, what does it do? And so let me, let me actually draw it, because essentially if, we, if I just talk about it, people say, well, I still don't, I'm not any closer to understanding what fading is compared, compared to, you know, before. So this is what fading's all about. I have a transmit antenna. I have a receive antenna. I might have some objects located around the transmit antenna. I might have objects located around the receive antenna. I might have objects also in between transmit and receive antennas. What do we know about electromagnetic transmission? So let's assume that the antennas are omnidirectional, equal amount of energy emanating out of the transmit antenna. So it basically looks like this. So the energy is going uniformly with the same strength in all directions. And the receive antenna is receptive to all energy in all directions, right? But what happens when I have this ring of scatterers, okay? So we're going to call this a ring of scatterers. And this guy here too. Ring of scatterers. Okay? What happens is some of those guys, so we're going to have, let's say, if this is not blocked, we're going to have a direct, like in this case, a line of sight or LOS component. And all these other guys, all these other radiation con contributions, all the other directions, if we didn't have the ring of scatters, if we didn't have these objects in between transmitter and receiver, that energy will just go out into space and never, ever, ever impinge upon the receiver, right? But what ends up happening is we get a reflection. And maybe that reflection goes, 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 goes right across over to this guy. Let's say by fluke. Theoretically, it's actually hitting that thing. But let's say it didn't. Let's say another guy goes past the ring of scatters, boop, bounces off of that guy, boop, bounces off that ring of scatter, and then hits the receive antenna. Let's say, for the most part, we have other of those rays that are emanating out of the transmit antenna that's ricocheting off the ring of scatters, that's ricocheting across those objects in between transmitter and receiver, that is ricocheting off of the ring of scatters at the receiver. Let's say it's multiple ricochets, boop, 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 and then all of a sudden re gets received at the receive antenna. You'll say, so what? Right? So what? This is why there's so what? The problem is that, okay, line of sight component. So of these ricocheted copies, of all these reflections, of all these, like first of all, all these, all these signals, this guy here, this guy, the line of sight component, and then all these other bounced versions of signal. Like this guy goes out to nowhere. Let's say this guy bounces, 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 right? Out of all those guys, which one will make it to the receive antenna first? Line of sight. Who said that? <laughs> no, no, but seriously, why? What's the speed of electromagnetic waves? Speed of light. Who is answering that? What happens is, the thing is radiation, radiation does not travel with infinite speed. Radiation like this travels at the same speed as the speed of light. That's why whenever we have lambda is equal to what? C over F. We have that C term, the speed of light term, right? 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. 
And what dictates how long we get there? It's distance. Question? No. Oh, OK. I'm like, ah. So what happens is the guy with the shortest distance that gets there is going to be the first guy. And then the longer, the more ricochets you have, the longer the path is to the receive antenna from the transmit antenna, the longer that copy of that signal gets there. So what you'll get, let's say we look at it, let's say we have an aside here, aside. So let's say we have like a timeline, right? Time. This time instant here, let's say that we call it zero seconds. That's the point of initial transmission. The line of sight component at T1 is the first guy that gets picked up at the receiver. Then, let's say this guy here, the next, shor the next shortest path gets received at T2. Let's say the next shortest path gets received at T3. Ah, and now here's where multipath kicks in. The, there are two paths that arrive at the same time at T4. This is what I'm worried about. So first of all, the amount of time that it takes for electromagnetic wave to get from the transmitter to receiver is finite. Here's the other thing. What happens is we saw this before with path loss, right? So 4 pi d over lambda squared is the path loss. Remember that from quiz three from several lectures ago? So the longer that I transmit, the more distance that I travel, the weaker my signal will get. But even worse, what happens when I hit a surface? Some of that energy from that wave gets absorbed by the material, right? So it gets reflected some, and some gets absorbed. Some things we don't know, especially with electromagnetic waves, when we hit a surface, we also get an arbitrary phase rotation, again, due to the nature of the material. So we get all these nasty little things that occur. So what happens when we get two guys that arrive at the same time? We might have two guys that might be completely out of phase with each other, maybe opposite in phase. What happens? They subtract off. And so when we have these guys all combined together, what we might end up getting okay, is this sort of mess. We get all these copies of the signal arrive with different signal strengths. Usually it's decreasing. And then a few instances, they actually get much weaker because they destructively combine together. Sometimes they constructively combine together. And we call this multipath. Now what's interesting is the fading kicks in. The fading kicks in. Because in some locations, we might get, like, let's say, a bunch of copies, especially when there's no line of sight, and we only get reflected copies. We might be in a spot where everything destructively combines. We're, we're, we're hosed, right? So I'm here, do, 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 and all the copies, all the reflections come here. They're all, out, they're all opposite in phase. They destructively combine, and I don't hear any wireless signal, right? I move two feet over, and voila, everything constructively combines. I have signal. But wirelessly, how does it sound like? Just forget about fading. Just the multipath, it's an electromagnetic echo, right? So this is the electromagnetic version of hello, 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 right? So what we've got here is an electromagnetic echo, and your receiver gets messed up by that. It's like, so which copy is the right one? Sometimes it's even worse. So in this speech world, so you have echo, the, the scientific term I think for it is reverberation. So you hear some, that was a good echo because I do bad echoes really badly. Um, so you know, you can hear the echo separately, but it will be like echo, you know, it's really messed up. It's not like the Grand Canyon where it's like, hello, hello, hello. Oh, that would be great. Now, so what ends up happening is that is something that we have to be concerned about. It gets even worse when we're moving, right? When we're mobile, that channel's just going at it. You'll have all those 
And like, you know, as we move fast from one position to another position to another position, we're looking at the wireless world and all those copies of those signals differently at every instant. So my radio has got to keep up and say, oh my God, okay, now I have this fading, now I have that fading. Now, so fading is this, art, this attenuation. It's weakening or strengthening the signal because the environment is creating all these copies and they add or subtract from each other at that instant. That's what fading is. Fading can be very complicated. Fading can also be fast fading, which means it might be low, now it's high, now it's attenuating low, now it's attenuating high. What happens is fading can change over time, especially when you're driving or moving fast. You have slow fading, which means I think the signal strength is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So you can actually see the fading actually taking action, right? Fast fading is like the channel is going nuts. It's like you can't keep up. The receiver can't keep up with the attenuation constantly changing. And then there's flat fading. Flat fading means all your frequencies of your signal are all being decreased and un, like, you know, basically attenuated and not attenuated all at the same time. The frequency selective, that's the bad one. That's why, so who had, who had stereos again? Stereo people? Woo! Did any of your stereos had like something called the equalizer? Equalizers? Yeah, so those are the high-end stereos, right? So you probably had something with like three, four, or five sliders, right? What do those sliders do? The equalizer fights fading, frequency selective fading. So what happens is, what does an equalizer do on a stereo? What the equalizer does is, oh, at um, 10 kilohertz, somehow my room, the acoustics, makes that frequency come in very weak. So what the slider does is, let's amplify that attenuated signal more. Oh, but one kilohertz is coming in perfectly fine. So you might not want to attenuate that any much more. Otherwise, it gets kind of messed up. Things just sound very funny. Also, it depends what type of music you listen to, if it's classical or if it's techno, right? So, so what happens is your equalizer re reverses the effects of things like s uh, frequency selective fading, where if one frequency is being really attenuated, you use this slider on your equalizer for that frequency to amplify it more than the others to undo that attenuation. Okay? Try it out at home. Take your stereo and play with those sliders. You know? I think mine's in Montreal still, so not going up there anytime soon. All right. Now, last but not least, and this ties into lecture 10, which we're going to talk about, uh, multiple access. So let's say all of us decide to go on to, like, you know, use our cell phones right now. How does the base station, the base station doesn't say, dip, 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 dip. okay, um, Timothy first, then Alex, then James, then, you know, like, like you know, ba basically it doesn't do something serially. Otherwise, I'm not going to pay the, let me think, what's my family plan? $100 a month. I'm not going to pay $100 a month. Just say, oh, okay. Are you done talking? Like, I want to talk. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. What happens is cellular networks and other types of these commercial centralized networks depend on supporting all of us at the same time, right? So I'm not saying, hey, guys, get off your cell phone so I can talk. Like, what would you say to that? Okay, I don't want to hear it, okay? So what happens is we need a way of supporting Multiple users, all of us at the same time. And so what there are, so you probably have heard of them. We're going to be talking about CDMA in the last one. There is frequency division multiple access. There's time division multiple access. And there's code division multiple access. And then there are hybrids of all of these. And so graphically, they look like this. So let's look at sp uh, frequency and time. So let's say... So let's say... Here's our frequency channels, frequency channels, channels. So that's channel one, that's channel two, that's channel three, that's channel four, that's channel five. And this is time. So let's say the way TDMA works, okay, is that let's say on a single channel, what would happen is I would get a time slice. 
So this would be Wiglinski's time slice. Then the next slice might go to person one. And then the next slice would go to person two. And then the next slice of that channel would go to person three. Oh, then it might go back to me. And so on, right? So what happens is the multiple access kicks in because multiple people each get a slice of a channel here is yours, 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 and then rotates, okay? So what the, what the network is doing is it's cutting everyone's time into these t uh, time divisions. That's why we call it TDMA. And then what happens is you have channel two, and it's doing that with another bunch of users, and then you have channel three and channel four, and so all of those guys are being divided up across time per channel, and then you have multiple channels. So that's why you, you look like you're talking continuously, and then Dan is talking continuously, you know, and then Zilu is talking continuously, but when in fact what happens is everyone's sharing the same channel, but at different time slices. It's, so it's not like we're talking on top of each other, it's almost like the network is dividing up our information, and the thing is you might not perceive it, but these time slices are really small. So for us to detect it, we don't hear anything, right? But the network is splitting up resources like that. So this is TDMA. On the other hand, FDMA, frequency division multiple access. The way it works is you have a dedicated frequency channel, right, for a certain period of time. And you don't, you don't have any of this, or, or maybe not even a, that big a frequency channel, maybe even something narrower. Okay, so, that's, so let's say you have a fraction of that, but it's yours. So your communication is conducted over that frequency. So you're not, you're not sort of, you're not multiplexing across time. What you're doing is one guy, let's say me, gets that sliver of frequency, Someone else gets this sliver of frequency. Someone else gets that sliver of frequency. But what happens is I'm not sharing across time. That channel. Okay. So what ends up happening? The difference is TDMA. Everyone gets a time slot. FDMA. Everybody gets a very narrow channel, right? Because look at the channel width for TDMA, it's much bigger, it contains more information. In FDMA, if you want to keep everything proportional in terms of the same amount of information in both cases, I would have a much narrower channel, but I have it for a much longer period of time, right? So there's some sort of conservation of, uh, of information. And then CDMA, which we'll talk about in lecture 10, is a funny beast. <laughs> what it does. So what does uh, uh, F, uh, CDMA do? What CDMA does, so ch uh, frequency channels, and this is time. What CDMA does is you're across all the frequency channels, and maybe you're across a certain time period, quite a long one too. But what happens is your information is spread thin across all those frequencies. And then someone is spread across you, frequency-wise. And then someone else is spread across both of you. What happens is there's a trick where everyone has a unique code. And what it does is it takes your electromagnetic signal and scrambles it and spreads it across the entire bandwidth, and only the receiver with the corresponding matching code, it, will, it has this magical property. It will extract out your signal and leave everything else in the noise. We call that a spreading code. So what ends up happening is CDMA, code, division, multiple access, every cell phone user, and that's like in 3G and 4G networks, Everybody has this unique code. It's huge. And what happens is it scrambles up your information. So everyone thinks you're noise. Your signal 
looks like noise. You won't see it on a spectrum analyzer or your RTL SDRs unless there's 50, 60 folks on the cellular network. And what happens is you just have 50, 50 levels of noise added on top of each other. So you'll see, what a noisy channel. That's 50 cell phones all communicating at once. And then the receiver with the matching code will extract the right signal and leave everyone else as noise. Beautiful, but complicated. I mean, the thing is, 3G had a horrible time making a product out of it because it requires some very fancy circuitry. Okay? Yes? Yeah, uh, well, the thing is, depend. Well, it really depends, and that actually is a great question to lead us into lecture ten. So, ah, oh, thank you, thank you for telling me to stop with lecture nine. Okay, thank you. Actually, I I do need that once in a while because I just go on and on and on and on and on and on. All right. So with that, that concludes lecture nine addendum. But that does not mean that we're done with lecture. I want to talk about lecture ten. So what we're going to do? No.